Greetings. My name is Guy Dornsey, and this is a show called Change the World, where, as you'll know if you're a regular viewer, I like to invite guests on who share my sense, my passionate sense of need for a future vision that's beautiful, that's powerful, that's sustainable, that's positive. And my guest today is the Mayor of Victoria, Lisa Helps. Welcome to the show. Thank I'm you so very much. glad you can join Thanks us. It's a invitation. big challenge running a city. It is, especially in the 21st century. You had a lot of background as community engagement, and then you were a city councillor for three years. What made you think, I want to make the jump and become mayor, run for mayor? Well, one of the things I saw when I was on city council uh, and, and when I was a community organizer is the great potential that our city has, that our citizens have. We're, we're, we're seeping with potential. We're seeping with good ideas. And yes. I felt that you know, my, my main mission, you know, why, I, why I ran for mayor because was because I thought that City Hall should be able to help unleash that potential right. rather than stifle potential. And that, that was my main reason, looking around, seeing all this goodness, all this amazing energy in our city, just wanting to help unleash it. And so that was my main impetus for running. Do you know, I'm doing a whole lot of work on building a new economy at the moment, and I'm finding a shift in the inner values from the, old, the older way, which is, as in the welfare state, we will provide for people and meet people's needs. And the newer way is, how do we unleash their potential? How do we, how do we provide Build with their other? capacities, let everyone be a genius in their own city. Absolutely. Yeah. And how have you found it? You're coming up to four years now. What's it been like compared to how you thought it would be? <laughs> you know what? It's honestly been way better than I thought. Um, and, and for this reason alone, you know, the, the mayor is the political head of the city. That's yes. what the mayor does. But when I was elected, I spent the Christmas holidays reading the community charter and learning kind of the full extent of my, I guess, power, we yeah. will call it, or yeah. authority. And the mayor is also the CEO of the corporation. And it's really in that role that I've had the most flexibility, the most ability to collaborate. You know, I, I'm at the council table and my job is to make sure that council's will is carried yes. out. That can be interpret, interpreted very, very broadly. So everything from childcare to housing, all of the big yes. problems. When you're the CEO of the corporation, you just call other people together and we come together and we fix things. So, so it's really that convening power that I hadn't right. quite anticipated. So you've got your planning department and your engineering department and your transportation people and your climate people and your social care and people people. Well, and, well, those are all the people at City Hall, but what I mean is actually reaching out into the community. Right. And so that, you know, to bring people together in the community, whether it's the challenges on yes. Pandora Street or childcare or housing yeah. or economic prosperity, that, you know, I've really used my role as mayor yeah. as kind of the, the convening, the convening yeah. aspect. So let me get the one frustration I know you've had out of the way, then we can get onto the positive stuff. Your experience with Facebook and with trolls, is it generic to being the mayor or is it personal to you as a woman, do you think? Uh, that's an interesting question. It probably is a little bit of both. I, I think you know one of the the most devastating things that's happening right now in in society, uh, you know, in addition to climate change, is that we've lost the ability as a human species to sit down and have a conversation yeah. when we disagree with each other. Yeah. And I think that social media really, really amplifies that. And so I I know that when I took on this job, it's a very public job, and people would you know attack me or criticize yes. me. Yes. That's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but that's part of the job. Yes. The reason ultimately that I got off Facebook is because people started to use my page as a platform to attack each other. Oh, and, right. Yeah, and you know, I didn't want to have any part of that. So, and you know what? I don't miss it at all. <laughs> at all. So let's get to the, the positive vision of Victoria. We have to fit together the, I mean, everyone knows we've got a homelessness problem. We've got a massive transportation congestion problem. We've got a huge affordable housing problem. We've got to tackle the climate crisis. People are urging ways to grow more food. How do you pass all those out and piece them together? That's a really great question. I mean, a city is kind of like nature, right? A city is a complex organism. And when yes. you're moving over here in one part, it's if you're doing it well, it's having a positive effect over here. So let's, let's take, for example, transportation yes. and affordability together. Okay. Transportation makes up about 15% of the average Canadian's household cost. Okay. In our region, it ranges from about 9% to about 16%. That Nine depends if you own a car or not, presumably. Uh, it depends if you own a car or not, but, but more uh, importantly, it depends on where you live. So people who live in Fairfield, for example, spend about 9% of their household income on transportation. People who live in Souk spend about 16%. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So in order to create better transportation and more affordability, we need to build the city and, and quite frankly, the region in a way 
way that integrates transportation and housing more seamlessly. So for example, if you live downtown and there's a moto car or yes. a car share car in your building, and you w live seven minutes from where you work, yes. um, your transportation costs are the costs of using moto right. to go hiking once in a while. So you, can, you don't need to own a car. You don't need to own you a car. You just join the car share co-op. You, when you need the car, you've got it, but you haven't got to bother with parking, insurance, and anything exactly. else like and, that. Exactly, and so, and so that means that you can, you've got more disposable income. Yes. So if you're renting, it means you can save to buy. If you um, you know, want to buy a condo, it means you've got more to service your right. mortgage. So that is, I think, a link that people haven't made between the cost of transportation and, and the, the way to you know, contribute to affordability. And that would also then be a, a reason to want to to densify the neighborhoods much more. Absolutely. So you've got people within walking distance of where they need to go. A absolutely, and you know, there's, that is, I think, one of the biggest debates that's happening in our city right now. Everybody wants more affordable housing. Yes. And everyone wants uh, you know, the young families to have jobs yes. and a place to live, but, but there's also a resistance to neighborhoods changing. Yeah. And that is going to be our biggest challenge because in order to meet our climate targets, and I can talk about those in yes. a moment, we need more people living close to the places they need to go every day. Yeah. It's that simple. So Todd Lippman talks about the middle housing. Yeah, like missing we, middle. It's not a massive big tower block and it's not a little bungalow. So what is the missing middle? Uh, the missing middle, and he's, he's really done a great job. Um, his analysis is that if every neighborhood grows by 1.5% per year, yes. um, we're gonna be okay as a city. And so the missing middle is everything from, you know, a fourplex on a single family yeah. lot to townhouses to mid-rise buildings. I mean, in, a, in some cases, it depends on the site itself. Right. Is it on a tiny street or is it on a secondary street or is yeah. it on an arterial? It basically means packing more people into the same amount of space. I think we should avoid the word packing, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Enabling more people to enjoy yeah, yeah, living right. in, in Well, that yeah, space. I guess it's true. Yeah, packing, <laughs> packing does have negative connotations. But, but our, our neighborhoods are, are great places. You know, what makes Victoria, Victoria are our neighborhoods. Well, well totally. I mean, I see people, they, they'll go to the Fairfield Village Center, and it is the greater density of people. You're going to bump into more friends, and the same in Fernwood, and the same in Oak Bay. People love those neighborhood centers. And, and, and young families, some, some of them do want to live in condos. Like there are people yes. who really, who want to raise kids in condos and that's what happens in a lot of places. There are also people who want to raise their families in neighborhoods yes. and young working people in Victoria cannot pay 800 or 900 thousand dollars or a million dollars for, for a big home that, that they can't. And so if we want yeah. them to be housed in the beautiful places that we love, we need to think differently about how we do it. I mean, I think the housing crisis is, is far bigger than most people realize. It just, when I, when I hear people on the, in the papers or the radio talking about, oh, well, this house only costs one and a half million, I'm thinking, what are you thinking here? Yeah. How can young people begin to have a place to live or a place they can call in? Yeah, up in Duncan, closer to where I live, a, a woman from, moved in from Vancouver and she was happy to be able to rent a place with three bedrooms for 2500 a month. In Vancouver? In, in, in Duncan. Oh, in Duncan. In Duncan wow. she was paying that much wow. and feeling excited by it. So, yeah. so tell me how the city is tackling the affordable housing crisis. We're tackling it in a number of ways. Um, the first way, and it's not the only way, some people get hung up on the fact that if you just build enough supply, there's gonna be enough housing for everyone. In, yes. in theory, that is true. And also, there needs to be certain supply for certain people. So the first, the first approach that we took is just get more housing built. So for 30 right. years, three zero, not 13, for 30, 30 years, years yes. in this city, there were zero new purpose-built rental. Ze wow. Zero. That's and because the federal government and the provincial government both signed off. For all sorts of reasons, and high interest rates, and so on and yeah. so forth. In the past four years, for all sorts of reasons, we've seen 1,000 new units of rental housing started. Now, the first thing people say is, well, it's not affordable, it's not all affordable. Yes. Okay, fair enough, but it's not zero, it's 1,000. Yes. And yeah. that, that is tackling the issue supply-wise. Yeah. But that doesn't help everyone, and yes. there's a whole range of people that need different forms and different costs of housing. And yeah. so the other significant thing we've done this, this term is, and I actually think this is remarkable, although it doesn't get too much press because it's yeah. too much good news, is we've brought into the region $90 million to build 2,000 units of truly affordable housing yeah. over the next five years. 
90 million. I was, I was aware of that. And yeah. I said, that's a big number. It's a in terms big of, number. It, that's partly provincial, partly federal it's money partly assisting. partly provincial, partly federal, partly regional. And putting that, putting that plan together took a good three years. Wow. And yes. that's a long time, but yes. it's a lot of money. So that's, I guess that's the, the second prong is yeah. working regionally to build affordable housing. And then the third thing, and again, this goes back to what I said earlier, yes. convening people, drawing on people's wisdom, getting a diversity of yeah. people around the table. At the very beginning of the term, we convened uh, Mayor's Housing Affordability Task Force, people who are struggling renters, people who are architects, people who are developers, yes. people who are policy yeah. people. And we brought them all together and said, tell us what to do. So you're talking about a 10-year plan for affordable housing. Right, 10-year plan for affordable housing that was really, truly co-developed with the community. And yes. that sets targets. It says by 2025, we need X number of units at X number of rents. And that's the city's responsibility. I mean, in partnership right. with the development community. So those are, those are really the three prongs. The housing strategy, the 90 million, and the just getting more supply unleashed right. after 30 years of nothing. Does that include tackling the homelessness problem on the streets? Absolutely. So those the $90 million, um, there are 2,000, well, 2,010 units. Uh, 400 of those units will be built um, and rented at 375 a month, which yeah. is the amount that people get when they're on income assistance. And for those people who are coming off the street who need it, there will be wraparound supports. And right. the beautiful thing about the, it's called the Regional Housing First Plan. Yes. The beautiful thing about that is that each building must be built with about 20% of units renting at 375, right. about 30% renting at 50% of market, yes. and another 50% of the units renting at about 85% of market. So okay. we're building mixed income housing, we're not yeah. ghettoizing anybody. And for the, the, the units at 375 for people who would might otherwise be on the streets? That's right. They're fairly small, I would guess, right? Uh, fairly small, yeah, some, some studios, some one bedrooms. Would some of these buildings include some common space for laundry or Meeting rooms Absolutely, yeah. They're meant. They're really meant to be communities, because yes. what often happens, um, you know, because there's been so little housing built and so little rental yes. housing built, um, people who are in say they're in supportive housing, yes. and they've overcome their addiction or they've overcome their mental health challenges, they don't need to be in that housing anymore because right. they don't need the supports. Yeah. But they don't want to leave because it's their home. Yes. And so with this new program, they won't need to leave the building. They might just need to move up to the fifth floor yeah. or up okay. to the eighth floor. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. So there's something quite beautiful about that. So I, I love the way you've been throwing out ideas. And sometimes people take the easy negative flag. Oh, what a silly idea that yeah. is. But unless we throw out ideas, we can't tell which out of the 10 ideas, which one's going to stick, right? Absolutely. So, and so we should never be criticizing people for having ideas, even if some of them don't work. One of the ideas has been garden suites. How, how is that proceeding? How's that being well received, do you think? Uh, it's it's been very well received and that again came out of the 10-year housing plan yes uh, the, the direction from the community was make it easier to build garden suites right uh, the garden suite program has been around for a number of years I think dating back to 2005 yeah. and before there's a little cottage in the backyard little cottage kind of in the backyard yeah. that's right and and before this term uh, and, and well into this term it cost about four thousand dollars and took about a year of time to oh. get a garden suite Process. So that's just exhausting for most people. Just right? exhausting because yeah. they're not going to do it. Yeah. And so we changed the rules so that anyone who has a single family home on a single family yes. lot as an entitlement can now build a garden suite. And the, the processing time is about four weeks and the wow. cost is about 200 bucks. And that's a huge change. Well, it is a yeah. huge change. And, and then yeah. so we, we changed the rules about a year ago. And yes. what we've seen over the last year yeah. are 22 new garden suites approved right. compared to something like 15 in the whole 12 years oh, of wow, the yeah. before. So it's, it's making a difference. It's so obviously, if people are watching and you have a single family house, it has to be built to code. It does. It has to be built stuff. to code. Yes. Yep. Yeah, but, but you know, we, we, we can't stop at garden suites. Right. I've had a, a delegation come to see me, very interesting, um, mostly women in their 50s and 60s who are worried about retiring without yes. a pension yes. and pushing us to have movable tiny homes as an entitlement as well. Yeah. And so we'll, you know, we'll take that up and see what we can do. But you know, I, I lived in Victoria 25 years before I moved up to Yellow Point around Ladysmith. And I remember on View Street, in the lot next to the View Street Tower, where there was meant to be a second building, it sat empty rubble on it for all those 25 years. Now I think even on a temporary basis, if you had a, a little village of, of tiny homes and they've got one year's notice to quit, if suddenly it's going to be developed, 
they could be living there as a little community on spaces like that. Well, I think on that site in particular, you'd want to do something like stacked modular units. Yeah. Um, tiny homes, I think, are perfect for people's backyards. And I was thinking more, more of a land that's sitting empty yeah. because some developer is just waiting. Mm -hmm. It's not allowed to sit empty for more than a year. Just allow people to live there temporarily. It's better than a camp city. You yeah. Know, even a regulated. Oh, better, absolutely. Right? Yeah. But I think you know BC Housing's modular housing project. That's the idea that those modular units can go there right. and they're stacked and they look like a building. And then when the developer is ready to build, they can be taken away. Yeah. Just on that site because there's so much. You know, it's on arterial. Yes. You could get more density there than just kind of yeah. 12 tiny homes. But also the garden suites idea would enable, if someone's really growing older in their home, Absolutely. they can have someone younger who can also help look after them. Well, and you know what, what we're seeing is, and this is I think really beautiful, intergenerational living. So yes. the parents are ready to move out of the house, so they move into a 650 square foot garden okay. suite, and the kids and the, their, their kids and move their grandkids the move into the house. And so you've got three generations living on one single family lot. And again, you know, that talk about affordability, yes. well maybe if grandma and grandpa are there, we don't need to pay for childcare. So that takes $1,000 a month. Right. You know, so, so we have to think about you know, all of the, yes. like, like you said earlier, the, the, the kind of the, the network. I think it, to me, it, I, I sort of, I'm aware that an awful lot of people who, with whom I share environmental values have a very doomy gloomy picture of the future. They think everything is really going downhill and bad. And yet, so I try to counter it with the vision of a future as an eco-renaissance. Eco, eco oh, and nice. It, happening in the cities in particular, where the city can be such an example of green living, with you can cycle where you need to get, there are fewer cars, there's affordable units everywhere, there's space to grow food, and our climate footprint can actually go to zero. And our economy can be very strong. Yeah. And so this is, you know, you'll, you'll be very excited, uh, actually probably during this interview, our climate leadership plan is gonna go live. Um, right. I should, I, you should really take a look at it, and the kind of the tagline is low carbon prosperity. Okay, so what are the top three hits of the climate leadership plan? The, the top three, well, there's kind of five categories, but the okay. top three are buildings, transportation, waste, right, and then municipal operations and um, adaptation. Yeah, so it says transportation and, and buildings, are the, by far the two biggest ones, aren't biggest. they? Biggest, yeah. Transportation, it's interesting, it flips when you look at the city versus the region. So in the region, uh, transportation is about 50% of our uh, yes. um, greenhouse gas emissions. In the city, transportation is 40%, buildings are 50%, and waste is 10%. Well, you have many more buildings. Many more buildings. And more cycling. And, yeah, well, and exactly, and, and a, smaller, a smaller footprint. The city is only yes. a tiny 20 square kilometer handkerchief. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've sort of, because I've been away from the city a couple of years, and you come back and I see the bike trails, and I see how many people are on them this so year in many. particular. Yeah. And I think this is, this, this, this is fabulous, but I, I, when I read the criticisms, I think do people not understand that everyone on a bicycle is not driving a car? Well, I They're doing make, us a favor? Exactly, I want to make, my idea is to make bicycle bumper stickers yes. that say one more parking spot. Right, every because every cyclist is one more parking spot well, for someone else. Bicycles can't have bumper stickers, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, okay, okay, you know those whatever the the mid bar stickers. Well, you could have my next my next car is a bicycle. Oh, bumper okay. sticker on the yeah. back of the car. Oh, there, nice. There's one saying, "My next car is an electric vehicle." Oh, okay. So yeah. obviously, people are still going to be driving. For sure. What does progress towards 100% electric vehicles look like? How do we get there? Those targets are laid out in the climate leadership plan. Yes. So our, our goal as a city is to be 100% renewable by 2050, and that means right. everybody. That means everything. And so in the climate leadership plan, we've got certain targets set for 2020, 2030, and then 2050. Right. So it's, it's a gated approach. Um, yes. it, it's encouraging electrification. It's encouraging partnerships with the hydro, with the provincial government, yeah. incentives, uh, right. all of those so, things. So would you, for instance, be requiring that all new apartment buildings of these 1,000 units, they must have electric charging points built into them? So that, that's coming uh, with the change in the building code. Again, the easier, the, 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 it, it's easier, it, the, let me start again. Yes. The higher up in legislation that the rules are made, the easier it is for everyone. Obviously, yes. So yeah, I think we're looking really very closely okay. and carefully at what the national, new national building code right. is going to be. The step code, um, yes. provincial step code, we're implementing uh, already. So yeah. things like uh, if they're not uh, built with charging stations yes. in every parking spot, they're, they're charging station ready. Yeah. So it'll be very easy for the owners to, to wire it in. And in fact, for Victoria, because 
everyone is living locally. You charge in it, you plug in at night in your own garage. That's where you're recharging. Well, exactly, and, and this is you know that's a very interesting point because a lot of people you know want to see more and more charging stations in public space. Yes. And you know we, we're looking at that. We do have an EV charging station. Well, strategy. tourists are going to need that when they come here. Tourists are going to need it absolutely. Yes. But locals don't. No, you know, no. locals can plug it at home. But I think there are people. Um, you know, again, the yes. city as an ecosystem. People who are moving into places that don't even have a parking spot because the you know the developer hasn't built enough yeah. spots because we've given them a parking yeah. variance. And so where do they where do they yes. charge? So th these are all the kinks we need to work out right. as we grow. And so for buildings, I know that we have some of the, pa the pioneers of passive house building here in Victoria, the Bernhardt father and son, right? Yeah. Who basically shown you can build a passive house that needs no heating whatsoever apart from a tiny heat recovery ventilator. And it was only 4% more cost or 5% more cost, they said. So do you think that, would you be looking that all new buildings would follow the passive house standard or something similar? That, that is actually going to be law in the province of British Columbia by 2032. Yes. So all new buildings by 2032 will be built to the passive house standard. Right. Um, there's different steps in the step code and yeah. right now we're, w along with Saanich uh, and I think some other places on the lower mainland are working pretty aggressively yeah. with the Bernhards and others and the development yeah. community to get there as quickly as we can. So, so let me give you my pushback on that, see how you respond. In, Be in Brussels, Belgium, they decided that by 2015 every single new house had to be a passive building and they achieved it. In Norway they're saying every new car must be electric by 2025 and the global climate science says we need to get to 100% renewable by 2030. Absolutely. So 2050 to me is a little bit, oh, tomorrow's, let someone else sort that out. I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> that, that is, so I'm, I'm really glad that you raised that because th I think this is our biggest challenge as a community. And I, I'm, I'm curious yes. to get your take on this. We think we're very green. We think we're very sustainable. And, and all of those things are true. And City Council has set a goal to be 80% less greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 over 2007 levels. Yeah. You know where we are now on target for? 32%. So if we keep going with, you know, yes. so now, you know, the population is growing and yeah. greenhouse gas emissions are going down at the same yes. time but only at a rate to get us to 32% reductions by 2050. That's a shocker, frankly. It, 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 and it, you're it, saying 80%, it, we need to be 100% by 2030. Exactly, exactly. And so uh, this is our biggest challenge. It's yeah. my biggest challenge as mayor. I think it's our biggest challenge as a community. It's the biggest challenge for business. Yes. We have a closing window. Yeah. We've got 10 to 15 years to achieve the Paris target yes. of no more than two degrees. Right or that's it. Because then the stuff we're talking about before, like all the new housing can be built to be zero emission. All the new transportation, the cycling, the transit, electric buses, electric trucks will be coming in, can all be zero emission. I think we could get there way earlier. Well, you, <laughs> and, and, and it, in a sense, it doesn't necessarily matter what you think or what I think. Yes. We must. We must. We, we must, and so my, my biggest challenge is how do we, and, and again, I'm really curious to get your take yes. on our climate leadership plan because we feel like our role in part of the city is to lead and inspire. So how do we motivate and inspire people yeah. to live radically different in the city? Well, my take is I've been involved in the climate issues for 25 years now, written two major books on it, blah de blah de blah The piece that's always been missing is public education. And when public education is done, it's always been, here's the problems, here's the problems, yeah. here's the problems. It's not on the inspiration Absolutely. of here's the future. Yeah, and, here, and that's what our climate leadership plan is to, meant to inspire. Here are the solutions. Yes. So, uh, here's what you can do. We, why approach the Royal BC Museum 15 years ago saying, why don't you exhibit on the exciting technologies and changes for the future, the, the solutions? And they were more, they wanted to do the science of adaptation and the stuff right. that is just more evidence that we're all going down a black hole. Yeah. But when you look at the solutions altogether, they're inspiring. They are inspiring. And I was in Montreal recently for the ICLE World Congress, but there yes. were people there from over 30 countries. And yes, we all have the same problems. We do. Yes. And there are so many solutions out there. Yeah. And we really, we need to, we need to inspire ourselves. We need yeah. to inspire our citizens. So I think that inspiration plus the whole idea of a future eco-renaissance, the city being greener, having easy foot transport, cycling, electric bikes, electric cars, uh, my inner vision of that is, is fantastic. What, what's your sense? If you picture yourself coming back to Victoria 
in 20 years? Well, what, it, yeah. If everything works out beautifully, what do you see? It, that's a very interesting question. So at the very beginning of the Climate Leadership Plan, there's the mayor's message, and I begin my message by imagining 2050. Right, and what's it look like? Well, what it looks like is we're in a place of low carbon prosperity. Uh, no one's been left behind economically yes. because we've used this necessary shift yeah. in order to create new jobs and people get the training they need, so yeah. it's not going to leave anyone behind. People are moving about the city in a way that has zero yeah. emissions that makes them happier So you're talking all the technical stuff? Yeah. What about if I suggest that it's joyful, oh, happier, and happier yeah, exactly. calm, relaxed? Yeah, well, and what I, what I actually say is that we're known worldwide for being one of the happiest cities and that, and that we show up on the World Happiness Index, which is done every yeah. year, in the top five. Yes. So we, we have to wind up now because um, half an hour flies by. It does. But I think that we need more emphasis on, on A, the, the fun of living in a, in a post-carbon way, in a future society, and the joy of it. It's very joyful. Stronger relationships with ourselves and with nature and with our neighbors. Absolutely, yeah. And, and if we do this well, which we must, yeah. we'll end up not only with low carbon prosperity, but also with a stronger social fabric. Yes. Well, I wish you and council and the new council fantastic um, inner prosperity to <laughs> make this vision happen. Absolutely, thank and you And I so know much. that it's a huge dedication. It's, it's way more than the paid job. The hours you put in are fantastic, the voluntary work involved. So look, thank you for all your leadership on this. Thank you so this. much. Thank and, you. and good luck with the coming, the next, whatever, the next 20 years. <laughs> next 20 years, <laughs> next, next 20, 20 years. years. Yes. Thank yeah. you.